All right. Welcome, everybody. I'm pleased to have Ms. Greer on today. It is my pleasure to introduce our January Practitioner of the Month, Greer McGinnis, a distinguished expert in the field of nutrition and holistic health. Greer holds a master's degree in dietetics and is a certified detox specialist, master herbalist, and Lyme specialist. Coming from New York, she owns the virtual practice, private practice, Biomedical Healing for Kids. She's here to talk today on decoding the connection, autism and MTHFR. Greer, we'll hand it over to you and thank you for being with us today. I'm excited and I think everybody else on the call is as well. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here and we're going to jump right in because I know everyone's been waiting for this. So super excited. Can you guys see my screen? Looks good. All right. Well, welcome everybody. We are going to be decoding the connection between MTHFR and autism today. So my name is Graham McGinnis. As he was just explaining, I am a dietitian and certified detox specialist, Lyme practitioner, master herbalist, and an autism mom myself. I'm a published researcher on my work on sulforaphane treatment for autism spectrum disorder. I'm a clinical lab educator and I'm, a, I'm the creator of the Rebalance Roadmap to Healing. I specialize in multitude of different types of topics between detox, autism, and ADHD, herbal medicine, genomics, food allergies and intolerances, gut health, and immune imbalances. So on the agenda today, we are going to be talking about understanding the genetic aspects of different types of genes, genomes. We're gonna be working on MTHFR genes, forms of vitamin B9 and B12, what MTHFR actually is and its importance. We're gonna be talking about the true signs of MTHFR, connection with toxic load, and steps to support the human body. So let's dive in. So this is my beautiful family and, you know, I would say probably about five, six years ago, if you told me I would be in this position with this type of a family or in this perfect photo, I would have never believed it in a million years. And the main reason why is because when my son was little, he was a perfectly normal, happy developing child until about 19, 20 months where unfortunately my son regressed. He regressed into what we call regressive autism. He was diagnosed with level two with a severe verbal delay. They did something called the VB map score, which is basically how you your verbal skills are at a specific age. So if you took Keegan into the kitchen, he could not label anything. He basically had very few words, not even mommy and daddy was a word that he would uh, say to, to us at all. He completely lost all the words that he had prior, prior to that. He lost eye contact, had horrific gut issues and constipation, and he basically screamed morning from, from morning to nighttime. That was basically how he would mostly communicate. And for me, it was very upsetting and very frustrating because I felt completely lost that I felt like I lost my kid. He became such an extremely picky eater. He was diagnosed with something called ARFID, which is a very severe feeding disorder with picky eating. He was not growing or gaining weight. I could barely get him to eat anything most of the time, unless it was Wendy's chicken nuggets. That was the only thing I could ever get that kid to eat. We took him to an endocrinologist and she told me to give him ice cream every night, which wasn't really something that I felt comfortable doing. And I said, man, I got to figure out something because after two years of a, what seemed like a hamster wheel cycle of you know, therapies every week and, you know, him being in school at four and a half, he still <clears throat> could not speak. He could not explain to us what he, his needs were. And you could see he's got his Woody and his book that he carried around literally everywhere we went for years. He even made it into Christmas photos because those were his objects that he needed that he felt most comfortable with. So now he will be 10 next month and he is doing amazing. So he can talk in full sentences. He can hold appropriate conversations. His VV map score is now an eight, which is only like a slight verbal delay in comprehension. He can read and write. He's actually a very amazing speller, which we're just finding out. He can do higher level math problems. We've expanded his diet. He's played sports and he is just the most amazing little boy. And I'm so grateful and thankful. And believe it or not, Max Gen Labs was one of the first tests that I actually did with my son because everyone kept saying, you need to check your son's genetics. And, you know, I started hearing about MTHFR. So Max Gen Labs was actually the first thing that got me started into understanding my son at a deeper level and what he really needs. And believe it or not, the human genome has about 20 to 25,000 uh, 
genes in the human body. And it just really depends on that person, their genetics, if they have variances. And so that's a lot of genes to kind of understand and to learn about. And we're basically going to be talking about one specific gene today. But I just want to explain a little bit about what we're trying to understand when we're talking about things like genetics or genomics and Genetics is the study of a gene and the way that the traits or conditions are passed down from one generation to the other. That could be like blue eyes or your blood type. So that's more or less genetics. And we've had a good standing amount of time to learn and understand genetics in our in our lifetime. Genomics is more or less about learning how understanding a specific disease state like heart disease or diabetes could play a role in someone's genes if they're more susceptible to that or not. Then we have this new thing where, you know, where we're learning about methylation, which is epigenetics and how the behavior in the environment can cause damage to specific genes. And then we have something called nutrigenomics, which I love as a dietitian, and I find it very interesting. And that's the study of in the interactions of nutrition and genes and that how you're, you know, if you're taking certain supplements, if you have a specific gene, it can maybe impact the way that you absorb or convert that specific nutrient in your body. So we have multiple different types of genetics when we're looking at the genome sequencing. So like I said, today, we're just going to be focusing on MTHFR and it's a big one. MTHFR is a very hot topic, but I want to break it down a little bit because when I first started learning about MTHFR, that's a lot of information. So let's break it down of how it's like, why it could be important, but what are the things that we need to focus on with it as well? Now, if you want to do some uh, more research and digging outside of this, Dr. Ben Lynch is kind of the godfather of bringing MTHFR more to light. And he has a book called The Dirty Gene, which you can uh, take a read and start understanding and learning about MTHFR at a deeper level and some of the other genetic SNPs when we're looking at methylation. So this crazy thing is our methylation cycle. And you can see it's a pretty complex cycle. I mean, there's a lot going on here, but this is something that's actually happening in our bodies every day. When we're talking about MTHFR, that's just one gene. And within the methylation cycle, there's multiple genes that play a role into this. So understand that this is something that's bigger than all of us actually really think that it could be. It's one little gene inside this huge cycle of what's going on. So with MTHFR, we have variances, and this is what's really important to understand and note. So with learning, this is where people come to me and they said, hey, I have the MTHFR gene. What do I do? And I say, well, what variants do you have? And they say, I don't know. I just was told I have MTHFR. We need to understand and break it down a little bit further. MTHFR is a gene. The variances are the different types of gene. So we have FR as a gene. Then we have two different types of variances that someone can have. They can have the C or the 1298C variant. Now that kind of gets broken down again, where you could have just one copy of one of those variances, which we classify as hetero, or you could have two copies of that variance, which is homozygous. You could also have what we call compound hetero, which means one of each. So we have to, when you do speak to a practitioner or somebody and you want to learn more about the gene, you should explain what the variance is because that's what's really important to understand. Most of the research that's done is on this heat where it affects homocysteine levels and it's the one that's most correlated with autism spectrum disorder. What's interesting though is my son has homozygous for the 1298C mutation. So when I've tested patients in the past, I do get a pretty big mix. So sometimes there could be a really strong correlation. And sometimes I also think that there's other pieces that go along with this, not just 
this one particular MTHFR gene. So with the MTHFR gene, you will see if you do a MaxGen Labs, they have a beautiful report layout, which I find very helpful and very simple for my patients to read and start understanding and learning exactly what's going on with their mutation. So this is a report mock-up. And when you would get a report, basically it would kind of look like, and you could see here, here's the MTHFR gene, the A1, 298C and the 677, and you'll see it highlighted in blue which one you would have. So for instance, this particular report, you'll see that the 677T, the person is positive, positive, so they have two, home, so they're homos. And wild type means negative, that you do not have a variant there. So it's kind of like a negative, you don't have it. But anything that is a heterozygous or homozygous would mean a positive variance there. That part's a little tricky. I promise it does get a little bit easier if you um, are in it a little bit longer. So methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase, say that five times fast. And basically what it is, is a gene that provides making the enzyme called methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. It is an enzyme that is very important that plays a role in the processing of amino acids, which are our building blocks to our human body. We need them. It also um, is important for the chemical reaction of involving folate, which is vitamin B9, and methylcobalamin, which is B12, into its active forms. However we get it into our diet or our food, that's how it basically helps to convert um, those chemical reactions. So it is pretty important. So there's different types of and different forms of B9 and folate, and I think it's important to address them too, because this is where people start focusing on the food that we eat, especially if you have MTHF. So one of the first thing we say, if we know that you're positive for MTHFR, we don't want you to eat anything with synthetic or form or fortified foods that have folic acid in it, because folic acid is a, a fake or synthetic form of B9. You'll usually see certain things like cereal grains and flours or fortified or enriched in those. So we usually stay away from those types of things, cereals, et cetera, we, which is the natural form found in food, which is what we would want more of what getting into our system. Then we have methylfolate, which is a reduced form of folate found in supplements. And then we also have something that's very big in the autism and ADHD world, which is leucovorin, and that is a very high level of folate. It is very bioavailable as a, it is found in supplements, but it also is in a medication form. And many times what people do is a test called the FRAT test, F-R-A-T, that look at binding and blocking of receptors, that if you are positive for one of those receptors, many times they will recommend folinic acid to increase the folate uh, intake into the body. So it is important to understand because maybe you're taking methylfolate and you're not really seeing a difference and you might need folinic acid. Or if you're taking folinic acid and you feel like jittery or you're not feeling well, you might want to drop it down to do methylfolate or folate because maybe it's not making you feel well and that's too strong. Similar to that, we have the B12 forms of cyanocobalamin, which is the synthetic form of B12. And that also can be found in many kids' multivitamins and adult multivitamins and fortified foods. So we definitely want to stay away from anything that has a cyanocobalamin in it. We have methylcobalamin, which is the most bioavailable form found in supplements, but also found in animal products as well. Hydroxycobalamin, which is a bioavailable form of supplements and naturally found in animal proteins. And adenosyl cobalamin, which is also another bioavailable form of supplement and naturally found in animal products. Now with MTHFR, you'll hear, hear a lot of people saying, wow, I, you really need to take methylated supplements. Well, to be completely honest, that could work for majority of people. For my son, it actually caused increased anxiety, increased jitteriness and hyperactivity. So I dropped down and did hydroxy and adeno as a supplement instead, and it, he handled it way better than he did methylcobalamin. So methylcobalamin could work for some people, but I, if I take methylcobalamin, I feel the same way. And my son and I share very similar genetic traits. 
So I think that has a lot to do with it. So I, I caution people with using high doses of methyls that many times if you do give a child high doses of methylated supplements, whether B12, that it can, if they do, depending on their genetics, it can actually kind of work and against you in that aspect too. So always stay cautious and you could always start with adeno and hydroxy supplements first and then move up to methylated supplements later on too, which is perfectly fine. So MTHFR, so MTHFR in the human body, around 40 to 60% of American population actually has one genetic mutation, which you might hear that a lot, especially from providers who say, you know, 40 to 60% of Americans have this. So it's not really that big of a deal. And I can kind of understand that if, if them saying that, because that is a large population, but again, we know so much more information about this particular gene and what it could potentially do. It's essential for a process called methylation. And this process actually informs in, involves enzymatic reaction and occurs billions of times per second in our cells. That's a lot. So it's constantly happening. Right now, we are methylating. As we are sitting here and talking, we are methylating. So that's how important that system is into our human body, which is why that particular gene holds a lot more weight than, than a lot of other genes. And every single cell and tissue in our body experiences methylation, which is really important. So again, it's why that one little gene plays, plays a huge role and a big impact. It's important for multitude of reasons, okay? Again, if it occurs in all the cells in our body, it plays a critical role in modify, modification of DNA, regulating uh, gametogenesis, which is sperm and egg development, embryonic and placenta growth, imprinting and epigenesis detoxification, DNA repair, energy production, building immune cells. We got helps make neurotransmitters. So your serotonin, dopamine, like your happy go lucky neurotransmitters regulates hormones, protein synthesis, homocysteine levels, glutathione production, mood balance controls inflammation. I mean, yeah, it does a lot of different tricks. So it's important to kind of understand your methylation cycle but it's not going to be as important as understanding your whole entire human body too. So here's something that I wanted to address because I see this quite often and I want to clarify what true signs of MTHFR actually are. So I'm sure a lot of you have seen, like if you have a stork bite, you know, when your baby was born, that means that they have MTHFR. Or if they have the blue sugar vein on their face, they, they probably have MTHFR. And I'm here to tell you that those do not like relate to MTHFR. Those are normal things that can happen um, during birth and it has absolutely nothing to do with MTHFR. There is no scientific clinical uh, research to support that whatsoever. And I know that there are several um, infographics that go around saying that and it drives me nuts because I'm like, you know, you're we want people to get the right information and that's not one of them. What What is a true sign of MTHFR is potentially having the sacral dimple in the back or having mouth ties. So mouth, lip, or the buccal ties, which are from the cheeks. My youngest is compound hetero. He has one of each and he had lip, tongue, and cheek ties. He had four ties. And my oldest, who is homozygous for the 1298, had no ties whatsoever. So it's very interesting sometimes how MTHFR plays a role into the human body in the methylation cycle and that certain things can be associated even though they might not have like that one mutation that everyone, you know, is so concerned about. So keep that in mind when you're seeing infographics or trying to really understand if your child has the true signs of MTHFR. This is really the only true sign that we have clinical data research to support at this time. So what are the signs of poor methylation? I do get asked this a lot, so I wanted to address it. And with kiddos, even we could see abnormal cholesterol levels with kids with autism and ADHD tend to have typically high levels of cholesterol, cognitive impairments, low energy, mood and sleep issues, depression, anxiety, digestive problems, migraines and headaches, allergies and asthma, and autism and ADHD. Those are actually all significant signs of poor methylation issues that are happening in the human body. So I think it's important to understand that a lot of these clinical signs and symptoms that we see as practitioners are 
sometimes the things that we see in ourselves too. I know my methylation cycle kind of is sluggish too, because some of these are the same. I used to have high cholesterol for no reason. And when I understood my methylation cycle a bit more, I was able to correct that. So there can be a lot of association signs here. And I just wanted everyone to know that this could be something that you see in your child, but you could also see in yourself as an adult too. So is genetics the true cause of autism? I get this all the time and I love explaining this. This is my favorite thing. I call it the three ring concept, okay? Genetics like MTHFR or an actual genetic mutation like fragile X syndrome can definitely play a role in autism from several different ways. We have genetics in the middle ring. We have metabolic disorders, so sometimes conversion of sugars or carbohydrates or proteins, that's a metabolic issue. And then they can connect to one another. And then you can have an environmental piece that connects to this, which I think people leave off that right ring a lot. And the research that's out there is very interesting because everyone, and I get a lot of you know, comments that, you know, autism is just genetic. Well, the research shows anywhere from nine to 90% could be a genetic factor for autism. That's a huge variable level. And that's not something that is specifically just science-based because we do know metabolic rates can account for 10 to 15% of autism. So that's why Many kids with autism get organic acids tests run because they're looking for potential metabolic issues that can arise and cause 10 to 15% of autism. Now, environmental factors can actually count for 40 to 50% of the actual autism diagnosis rate out there. And in the amazing words of the Jersey Shore, hello, like that's a really big piece of the puzzle that we're, I think we're really missing of research that's out there. And that's what I want to get out in the world. So environmental factors that are linked to autism is things like advanced prenatal age or at time of conception, which we are no, we do know that the older you are, when you conceive the, like there is a higher risk of having a child with autism and ADHD. That's pretty common knowledge, but I don't see that very often in my practice too. We could have a premature birth or difficulty during labor where we have decreased oxygen to the brain. That's pretty, pretty well standard as well. But then we have this prenatal and toxic pollution and toxic load to that particular mom. And that could be anything, even for children, heavy metals, aluminum, mercury, lead, chemicals like pesticides, plastics, and mold. So we really can have a multitude of environmental factors that if mom's methylation cycle is shot and child's methylation is shot, that's where we could get that into our system. And we do know that there are tons of toxins that are linked to low IQ scores. That is very well known. That's very well researched. So it's not something that is just made up. We know that this happens. And when we test and I test my patients, they come up high for a lot of these all the time, especially things like glyphosate, BPA, mold, heavy metals, pesticides. I see it throughout my patients. So it is really important to understand that the methylation cycle not only affects the mom when she's pregnant, but also baby as she as that child is growing too and accumulating those toxins from birth. So what I mean by neurotoxins, and you know, if you're unfamiliar with the term, is that these are poisons that act on the nervous system. And these can cause tissue death, cell death. They can cause all different types of damage to the brain, what we call the myelin and the white matter. It could damage all that, especially in utero or as de- as the child is developing and cause all sor- sorts of types of developmental issues, including you know ADHD, autism, depression, memory loss, et cetera. So neurotoxins have been around for a very long time. And it's something that we need to make sure that we are monitoring especially the toxic load and of our patients. People aren't really truly aware of how many toxins we're in we come in contact with, so I wanted to break this down too. We come in contact with about 800,000 chemicals, okay? That's a lot of chemicals that are out there in the world. We know that about a thousand of them are known to be neurotoxic in experiments. We know this, and they're still being used in around every single day. 
209 of those chemicals are known to be neurotoxic uh, to human beings, and only 12 of them that we have tested of those are known to cause human neurodevelopmental issues. And those are a lot of the ish things that I listed previously on the slide of things that we know cause low IQ. So we still are around those toxins every single day. So that's why it's kind of important to understand that chemical um, response and the toxicity is something that will damage your methylation cycle and continue to make you accumulate more toxins if we're not really sure what's going on. So, but does that mean, what does that really mean for most people? There's a really good saying, which is genetics load the gun and the environment pulls the trigger. Because I don't want you to think you're doomed if you do have MTHFR or you do have a specific gene mutation, because that's not the case, okay? And I want to show you a for instance, is if you have a child who has a genetic mutation, say they have a gene. If that child lives in an environment that has high amounts of environmental toxins, they drink contaminated water all the time, they're living in mold, et cetera, they don't have a really clean eating diet, then they, yeah, that increases their risk of having autism, ADHD, or a chronic health condition. But if you have another child who has the same exact genetic mutation and they leave a really clean lifestyle, they eat healthy, they live in a low environmental toxin area, then their risk of having autism, ADHD, or health, chronic health condition actually is so much lower. So genetics can, you know, our genetics have not changed over the years. It's our environment that's changed. So sometimes just because you have a genetic mutation does not mean that you are doomed forever and you have MTHFR and you, and you're going to have all these things or your kid's going to have all these things. No, it's really how our environment plays on that particular person and child that makes that outcome what it is. And this is another infographic that I see all the time. And I want you to know that that's wrong too, but you'll see where it's talking about different types of mutations and your ability to detoxify mercury. Well, and partly it's kind of true to a certain extent, because we do know that if you have the 677 mutation, the first two, it does really deplete your ability to detox. We do know that. But I also don't agree with the 1298 being as low as it is too, because I think it does still impact. Again, my son has the W mutation of the 1298C and he had tons of metals, tons of mold. He wasn't detoxing. And so I think that, you know, when we look at graphs like this, we do need to take them with a grain of salt and understand that not everyone is going to be the same because I've met people with the 677T and they, they methylate and they detox beautifully. So it really does depend. So I just want you guys to keep aware of that. I wanted to debunk a lot of myths here too. Okay. So let's talk about some detox concepts here, because this is something that I think everyone always wants to know a lot about and how methylation works in this aspect. When a toxin comes into the body, any type of toxin, it tries to go into the liver to start converting into water-soluble waste substances. So we have what we call those fat-soluble toxins. And it doesn't always work out like this. It doesn't always have to go to phase one and phase two. It could go right to phase two and out two. But for the grand scheme of things, we'll talk about it this way, where a fat soluble vitamin or I'm sorry, fat soluble toxin comes in to phase one. Okay. And it gets converted into a water soluble substance. And then that, that goes to phase two and that water soluble substances goes out and gets eliminated from urine, bile, or stool. That's how it should go. So when people, and I see this quite often, when we take B12 and folate, which is needed. We could see here all the nutrients that are needed in phase one. We kind of rev up phase one detoxification really, really rapidly when we take high levels of B12 and high levels of folate. But if you look at phase two of what we need, we actually need a lot more nutrients than phase one. So if we rev up phase one, and phase two isn't working, what happens is, is those fat soluble uh, toxins that come in create something called free radicals. 
or react, reactive oxygen species, which are basically toxins. And then those toxins go into our system and cause oxidative stress and damage our cells. So this happens quite often when people learn about MTHFR and then they start taking all this methylated supplements of B12 and folate, and then their kid goes a little crazy and starts trying to detox really hard. It really puts them at a disadvantage. Okay, the best way I can explain this too is the I Love Lucy scene where I Love Lu Lucy is phase one, Ethel is phase two. And you can see when phase one gets kind of over, over, what am I, like, like over, overpowered, phase two is having a really hard time keeping up too. And that's what we don't want it. We want it to be like a nice flowing conveyor belt of things. So if we have a lot of those free radicals and going into the system because we aren't methylating well and we're not detoxing well, those normal cells actually get damaged by the free radical cells. And then it causes what we call, call stress. And oxidative stress causes tons of inflammation into the body, not just for kids, but for adults too. So we do want to be careful of how we are working with methylated pe people who have issues with methylation and how much supplements and nutrients they're taking, because we do tend to overdo it right away. And that's what we want to try to avoid. We want this to be a seamless process of working with our patients and saying, okay, we got to set up our foundations and our system. But you can see that if somebody has high amounts of free radicals causing oxidative stress, it could affect all different aspects of the human body, not just one. So we do want to be careful because the more inflammation we have and the more circulating of toxins that we have, that could be a big problem later on. So usually I tell people we need to walk before you detox. We need to like, you know, let's not put the cart before the horse. And when we're learning about MTHFR, and like I said, this, I wanted this presentation to really debunk a lot of the MTHFR and autism issues and connections and things like that, because there is a lot of misinformation or information that was taken and kind of interpreted differently, which is kind of like playing telephone. And so we do need to work with the human body and go in order of how it's supposed to work. And I think that's what people forget is just taking supplements isn't going to solve your problem. We need to kind of go back to our basics. And the first set of basics is working on the microbiome. And the reason why is because the, the gut is the engine to the whole entire system. And that includes absorbing and digesting your food to take in those B vitamins or folate and, and your nutrients. It's responsible for digesting, oops, digesting food, absorbing nutrients, neutralizing toxins, eliminating toxins. If your gut isn't working, the rest of the system isn't working, including your methylation cycle. Believe it or not, your gut is also responsible for helping to create neurotransmitters and some B vitamins. So it's important that the gut works first before we start taking tons of B12 and folate like quickly to think that that's going to be a quick fix. Because a lot of the times I never have to put my kids on high levels of B12 and folate, especially if I fix their microbiome and their nutrient status first. So step one is always the microbiome. That's the first part of just working on the gut, doing a stool test, making sure that your lymphatic system is open and drainage, you're pooping daily, which a lot of our kids don't. So always the gut is going to be step one. Step two is the micronutrients. We need to replenish all of our vitamins, minerals, amino acids, antioxidants, and a lot of times I will get practitioners from other, you know, I'll get patients from other practitioners that just put them on all these vitamins first. And it's like, well, how does your gut look? Cause are you even absorbing them? You could be wasting your money and not actually absorbing the nutrients that you really are supposed to be getting. So first we want to work on the gut. Second, we want to make sure that the micronutrients are good too. And many times I'll test kiddos and their folate and B12 will be low 
once I work on their gut, it rises because they are actually eating enough to sustain their system. I actually posted this today because this is what we think we need when we hear MTHFR, but we actually need a lot of other nutrients that go along with the methylation cycle. So remember that really big, crazy methylation cycle that I showed you earlier. I broke it down to just show you a little piece. And I want to draw your attention to the little purple circle ones. And you'll see that these are all the different types of nutrients that are also needed in order to make the methylation cycle work. So if your kid is low in vitamin D or iron or zinc or magnesium, it doesn't even matter what their MTHFR is. The methylation cycle is not going to work because those nutrients are needed for the rest of the cycle. So sometimes we do need to take a slow down and look at what else is going on with that person and what they could be missing in order to bridge the gap and make sure that they're A, getting all the nutrients they need before even addressing increasing folate or B12. So can toxins be removed? A hundred percent, yes. I created something called the rebalance roadmap, which helps to, we need to identify the toxin first. We need to see what we're becoming in contact with because the toxin itself can damage the methylation cycle. So if you're constantly drinking contaminated water or urine mold, that will damage your methylation cycle. So we need to identify if you're in contact with any type of toxin in general and avoid, avoid, avoid. That's pretty self-explanatory. I use my rebalance roadmap to build up the child's body first. And then we work on priming the body to allow for proper detoxification and then we use specific targeted supplements depending on that toxin to safely and, and effectively remove it from the body. I've written many guides and interpretation guides on different types of toxins and specific supplements that we know and have studies on that help remove those particular toxins. And they are very effective. But I want everyone to understand that supplement plans should be individualized based on your child's needs. Every single person in this world is a completely different person. Your genetics are different. Your body system's different. Your intake is different. Your needs are different. And especially for a child, their, you know, what their body needs as they're growing in different states and different areas are completely different. So we want to make sure that we treat based on the individual and what they need. And that's usually where I say test, don't guess. So we know exactly what that child needs so that the interventions could be very targeted. Because we all come in different shapes and sizes. And I'm sure you see that when you pick up your school or your kid from school, that the, all, all kids are all different and their diets are different. Their intake is different. So we want to be very specialized. We want to work with kids on different levels because we could be, some of my kiddos have very low sensitive of detoxifying uh, systems. And some are very high sensitive detoxifying systems where if you put them on a supplement, they might react very negatively. And then I have kids that I could put them on 10 supplements and they handle it just well. So it's important to know where your kid falls so that when you are detoxing and you are working with them, you have that good foundation set up with them so that you're able to safely and effectively remove the toxins from their system. And what's great is I do have an ebook that helps a lot of my families start that foundation piece. It's called the Rebalancing Kids Roadmap. It will help rebalance their system and work on methylation as well. It's called the Five Phases of Detoxing. It's a step-by-step -step -step checklist to help set up your whole entire foundations to make sure that your kid is going to be rebalanced and they can work on their you know, nutrition and diets. There's a food shopping list in there. There's supportive nutrition supplements if you need it, tips for rebalancing them, opening up drainage pathways, different detox supplements, additional testing and support. So I really tried to jam pack this ebook for my patients because I get everything. I get, I have MTHFR, I need to detox mold, I need to detox heavy metals. Like how do we go about doing that? but in a safe and effective way so that, you know, we can get a good foundation piece. 
And if you're interested in this, it also comes with a free 31 day breakfast and lunch allergen friendly kids meal plan to help you figure out, you know, if you're trying to be gluten free, dairy free, corn free, soy free, then I have a lot of great bonus tips and tricks for you on here. And so if you sign up and if you're interested in getting the ebook, there is a code you can use MaxGen10 to get 10% off your ebook for anyone who is attending the lecture or sees it in the replay. So I hope you guys you know, enjoyed this presentation. I hope it kind of helps put a little bit of the puzzle pieces together and we will open it up for Q and A. All right. <clears throat> Do you have access to these questions or you want me to read yep. them to you? No, I got them. Okay. So I have, I just giving spectrum needs and it seems to help take away hyperactivity. Will with speech fish oil from Nordic natural seems to have the most positive impact. Yeah. So when the brain, by the time a child is almost five, the brain is 90% developed. 60% of the brain is, is fat. So, you know, giving, you know, fish oils and giving the right types of vitamins like B6, which is also important for the methylation cycle is also really important for neurotransmitters, including converting glutamate into GABA, your hyper, you know, so when you have hyperactivity, you might have high glutamate, you give B6 sometimes or P5P that converts to GABA. And then you might have a calming, you know, a more calm child, which is great. And I think that is amazing. So my child did have a sacral dimple, sleeping a lot as a newborn, also a sign. It was hard to feed her. She was a very sleepy child. No, that a lot of times that kind of thing, the sacral dimple is a part of MTHFR, but the sleeping a lot could just be the, the kid. My oldest slept a lot. It would be hard to wake him up and feed him. Some babies are just sleepier, but my youngest was slept on my chest for 24 seven. So I think, you know, I think it's just, that's more or less just the, the kiddo. How young can you be have on this test? Would love to test my six month old. So yeah, it, you can test a six month old. So, you know, depends on the testing. I mean, stool test is easy. That's just collect stool from a diaper. The other like toxin test and stuff is a urine test. So that is a little bit trickier. You can put organic cotton balls in the diaper and then squeeze them into the pipette and then you could test it that way. But, and that, and that could be great. You may or may not see much at that time, but you can definitely, you can definitely do that. The MaxGen panels are cheek swabs, so they're easy to do it. Yeah. Yeah. The cheek swabs are the easiest. There are some like genetic testing that does like spitting. And for any of my autism kiddos, like I just say, don't even bother because that's just not going to happen. I said, do anything that has a genetic swab. I was like, Max Gen is the easiest because it's just a quick swab and you could do it when they're sleeping if they won't let you do it during the day. I'd love more info on to do testing. Yeah. You can always reach out to me at biomedical healing for kids and we can definitely chat about testing. I usually set up introduction call with my family is to understand more about what's going on and especially about their kiddo. So I can, you know, best give them a direction on where to go with that. If my son with autism has it from genetics, can changing his diet and detoxing still help? Yeah, a hundred percent. It doesn't. So there, I, there's two different types of autism. There's a genetic form of autism where we know that there's a specific gene that are impacting them. And then the other form is an environmental piece from that. And both can still be helped. Still both can be supported a hundred percent. And I've had kids that have had different types of genetic abnormalities. And then, and we've still been able to do amazing things and help them, you know, even kids, I've had kids with down syndrome and we've helped them tremendously. So it really just depends on that kiddo because if they're only eating five things and they're deficient, yeah, that's going to make things way, way worse. My wife has been diagnosed with MGUS. Can this genetic test help get this diagnosis under control? I'm not a hundred percent sure because it, just because your wife has a genetic diagnosis doesn't mean automatically that your child will, would be, but you would have to test the child to see if there is any anomalies there. So that one's a little tough just because, so just be, if I had a genetic mutation of, you know, like, so cystic fibrosis, I'm a cystic fibrosis carrier. That doesn't automatically mean my son's going to be a cystic fibrosis carrier. So definitely always just test the child's genetics first. I think everyone overlooks mom mental health and how it affects our system on a cellular level and how it might cause autoimmune 
autoimmunity and even autism and chill in a child as immune response. I'm at some crazy. I feel like, no, you're hundred percent right. I mean, that's, so we know a lot about mom. Like if mom's microbiome is abnormal or have has issues. If mom has Lyme disease, that can all carry over into child. I've tested kiddos who have had high levels of like barium and mom had an MRI with contrast. The child never did, but the mom passed on the barium to the child. So mom's mental health and her body in itself affects the the child significantly. Do you have to keep testing during healing the brain and body? So many of my families do repeat tests and it depends on the test. So like, say for instance, you know, you know, the child came back with tons of mold. The likeliness is is you'll want to test a few times to know that the mold is coming out of the system and get out of the body. So sometimes you do have to do multiple testing and sometimes it just depends. I mean, I have parents that can't afford it and I try to help as best I can work with them. And as long as we're consistently seeing improvements, sometimes parents just opt not not to test. So it's really up to you. Am I able to contact you again? Because this was a lot of information. And the... Yeah, you can definitely contact me. I mean, this wasn't really, I didn't want to give too much information on supplements because supplements are individualized, but that's why it's important to test and understand your child's genetic you know, mutations and then their diet and stuff like that. But yeah, you can definitely reach out to me. Um, and set up an appointment. I can definitely help you. A lot of parents come to me with that specific questions because supplements is hard. If a child is having a whole exome sequencing of their genetics, then will the be in the genetic testing? It may or may not, to be completely honest. And the reason why I'm saying that is because sometimes geneticists, depending on who you go to and what they're wanting to test for, when I went to a geneticist to do a whole exome sequencing for my son, because that's what they told me to do, I asked to have the MTHFR done. And the and literally the geneticist looked at me and said, why your son has autism? What does it matter? So it just sometimes depends on who's doing the testing and if you're doing it with like a kit or if you're doing it with a person. So that really depends. Does leucovorin give noticeable results with speech improvement and cognition? So yes, leucovorin can give noticeable results with speech and improvement and cognition. Sometimes it depends if that's what we, what we call it is cerebral folate deficiency when that's with the frat test and the binding, the blocking, but yeah, leucovorin can definitely give for some people it's been amazing. And I tried it with my son. He was negative, but I still tried it and I didn't see any difference whatsoever. So it really just depends. What if MB12 shots are not having any effect? Does that mean he's not, they're not absorbing it? Okay. So that's a good one too, because that's a, I feel like there's like an autism checklist, a leucovorin check, P12 shots check. Like, I feel like there's like a autism checklist that doctors go down. I have had a 50, 50 shot with B12. I've had some patients that it's amazing. And some patients that they saw no results and it only incre- increased hyperactivity. So sometimes I usually look into something deeper and say, it's probably not a B12 deficiency that your child is having. So if it's having no effect on them at all, that I would just kind of scrap it and move on and, you know, go back to your foundational pieces, you know, water. I've seen on certain pages that if you carry MTHFR gene, you should avoid fish due to mercury. Is that true? So Yes. Well, fish in general, certain fishes like tuna and stuff have higher level of mercury in them. There are lower level mercury fish. There's a really great company called, what is it? Catch? I think it's Catch. They test all of their fish for low levels of mercury. Safe Catch. Safe Catch is the company and they're great. So I I think fish is important. My son eats tuna fish and I encourage him to eat tuna fish, but I use safe catch to make sure that it has the lowest amount of mercury possible. No different than if you're eating rooted vegetables that are still from the ground that has different types of heavy metals in them too. Heavy metals are almost unfortunately unable to be avoided to a certain extent, but fish to me, especially omegas, if your kid eats it, 
I would say once or twice a week getting the, and you can Google a list of like the lowest amounts of heavy metals in the fish and that in safe catch would be one that you could buy. I think it's at Whole Foods and Sprouts and stuff like that, or you can order it online. I started my son on gluten, diet, gluten, dairy, casein free, and I see big changes on him. He has autism. I'm thinking to start your program to help him with more. Yeah. So diet, gluten and dairy is usually like the two biggie pieces for many kiddos. And that's because gluten and dairy impact the opioid receptors of the brain. Basically, it's like a morphine impact. So if you're seeing that, that means that you're on the right track of decreasing in overall inflammation and working on their system to rebalance in their brain, which is great. That's fabulous. I love it. What do you think about high doses of iodine for for ASD? I've never had to give somebody elevated iodine to be completely honest. Oh, I should rephrase that. One kid who had thyroid issues. Uh, but th- that's the thing. It's individualized. So it's no different out there with like why certain diets for autism, like, you know, that gluten and dairy free, you know, it might work for her. She's seeing great responses, but I've had people who are dairy and gluten and they removed it and their kid had no entire and like no improvements. Doesn't mean that it didn't work. It just wasn't what was impacting that particular kid. So if it's something that would work for your kiddo, that might be a great thing. You're welcome for the presentation. Do viruses be a trigger for ASD. Yeah. I actually just tested a patient. Her labs just came back with her son is pans and pandas, strep, Epstein-Barr, cytomegalovirus. Yeah. Those could, viruses in general can impact and cross the blood brain barrier and cause cognitive issues to the brain. hundred percent. I usually test if people want for those, those are optional. Can you explain what about synthetic folate? folic acid actually causes blockage storage issues. It's not just absorption by issues. I think you touched on it in your section of these. So with, with folic acid, like fake folic acid, there are diagrams that if you look up like conversion of folic acid into the system, folic acid has to go through many multiple extra steps in order to be converted into folate or methylfolate. So a lot of times if you're trying to convert something at a higher level and there's all these issues in between, it's not going to convert. It can actually build up into the system, no different than B12. And many times if I've tested kids' micronutrient levels, those levels build up in the serum, in the blood, and many of those kiddos have hyperactivity. So we want to be careful. That's basically almost like imbalancing vitamins and minerals in the system. And it causes all sorts of issues. Do you have a favorite diet to go with all his, I'm trying to fold gaps. Can't get mine into, oh, so gaps is hard. (laughs) Gaps diet is a really hard diet. My favorite diet across the board is the Mediterranean diet. You can modify the Mediterranean diet with gluten and dairy free options. Does insurance cover genetic tests? Chad, does you do you guys cover use insurance? No, we don't. The, yeah. the insurance game is not something we really want to play because there's denials and it's just more it, the it really saves the patient no money to begin with. And then we have to abide by certain regulations and you know we can't test all the genes that we want to check for. They're, they're very specific. They want us to order one, one gene at a time and then bill that. And we just can't, it would, it would throw off our entire panel and really do everyone a disservice because of the day, the amount of information we'd be able to give out would be like nothing. So yeah. we've really tried to keep our overhead low and our prices low to kind of compete with that market. Cause even if you're going to your insurance, you're trying to get that to cover just an MTHFR test through your PCP, they may bill you seven, six, you know, I've seen people pay $800 just for MTHFR and the insurance denies it. And then you're stuck with an $800 bill, not to mention deductibles and all of that. So, you know, with us, you get almost a hundred genes for $199. It's really, it's just not worth the headache and the risk of trying to bill insurance because there's the the legal issues with it. Agreed. I mean, you can do a geneticist, but they're only going to test for a handful of genes, mostly related to autism. Using Max Gen Labs gives you a little bit more of a varied looking at different types of the genomics, nutrigenomics and stuff. You get like a little bit more of everything. 
My kid has MTHFR 6, 7, 7 T, homozygous. He is not responding to therapies, diet. He has lead and other heavy metals. What's the next step? Okay. Yep. So <laughs> then toxin tests would be first resetting basically like my foundation pieces, because you got to go back to the beginning. We got to go back, test his gut, see what's going on and then readjust because if he's got built up and he's not releasing toxins, that's a problem. What type of probiotic do you recommend? Mm, probiotics are tough. It depends on the person. There's so many out there, but I usually test the microbiome first in order to figure out exactly what the best uh, probiotic is because there's just too many and you should really start with one that your body needs and then add in other ones. So my son regressed after having dental surgery. He is diagnosed with high functioning autism. He's a picky eater. Oh, so, so, okay. So dental surgery is due to anesthesia and usually that because that depletes B vitamins and other issues with MTHFR. So doing some type of like detox and stuff might help, but it really just depends if something altered the neurotransmitters and issues there. So it's not just a quick fix with a, like a detox product. Unfortunately, you would have to kind of do a little bit more digging and kind of see what happened there. Cause something, something changed. And a lot of times it's the B vitamins. All right. Last question. I think we have, I was told my son has MTHFR gene, but he didn't further explain all he said was to take folate. What kind of question should I ask the, I would just ask for your, your lab results. I mean, that's, that's part of what I was saying at the beginning is, you know, patients come to me, they say I'm positive for MTHFR, but I need to know the variants that you have. So I would find out what the variance is first, and then you can put in the specific labs that you need to kind of dive in further to see if there is a issue with the MTHFR methylation cycle. Awesome. Is that it? Yep. That was that. That's all I had. I've got one series that says, so Max Gen test does testing other than genetics. Max Gen is mainly a genetics lab. That's basically all we do, but we do do food sensitivity and environmental toxin screening through the urine. Other than that, but we, we specialize in genetics. All right. Well, that's it. Thank you, Ms. Greer. That was amazing. One of the best ones we've had so far. I think we've never had this many questions, 32 in total. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Of course, you can follow Greer online, join her Facebook group, more than welcome to contact her as well. She's a great source of information. I've been following her for a while and I have nothing negative to say, just nothing but great things. So thank you, Ms. Greer. Thank you. Uh, thanks for joining in.